Good morning. This is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, and it is April 8th. This morning, we're taking some continuing testimony on the child care bill, S1, uh, H171. And we're going to hear from some folks who um, have important information to share with us on 171 and their own um, organizations and the, the workspaces that they represent. So um, good morning. Uh, Sarah, did you want to um, kick this off? Uh, how did, uh, I'm, I'm open to that, how you would like to organize this a little bit. Sure, thanks Madam Chair. I'm happy to say just a couple of comments just following up on last week's conversation, um, but I wanna make sure most of the time is dedicated to the great witnesses who you have lined up this morning. So um, I just wanna start by thanking the committee again for your thoughtful conversations about this. I've been really appreciating both the conversation last week and as we've been listening in on YouTube to some of your discussions as well. Um, the overall picture, just before we sort of dive back into the details today, um, families are struggling. And you'll hear more about that from the programs who are supporting some of the families who are struggling the most in our state. Um, the pandemic, as we know, has highlighted some of the deep inequities that already existed across the board and childcare is no exception. Um, early childhood educators have been on the front lines all along during this pandemic and need fair compensation for that. Um, this bill, H-171, makes changes now for families who are in the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. It expands it a little bit. It strengthens the pipeline of new early childhood educators, and I'm sure you'll hear this morning about what a challenge staffing is in many programs. Um, it sets important wheels in motion with two studies, so the systems analysis and the financing study to really chart our course for the state um, and give the legislature some concrete solutions and options to, to work with in the coming years. Um, so ultimately this bill is about families and the economy and our workforce, but mostly it's about children um, and our youngest children and our state's commitment to them. And so I'm really glad that you're hearing this morning from Head Start programs and from the Otter Creek Children's Center. Um, these are exemplary programs. They're very high quality. Um, Head Start nationally and in Vermont really sets the standard for what high quality care can look like what, um, with highly paid or you know, well compensated and well supported employees, um, high quality spaces, and even in spite of all of that, those programs are still struggling because of the lack of state investment um, in a more holistic way. So, and that's even with the significant federal pandemic supports and state supports that you all have helped to, to mobilize over the course of the past year. So um, I'm really glad that you're gonna be hearing from these folks this morning. I just wanna leave you with, um, in, the, in the house, um, the committee talks a lot about how Vermonters and especially Vermont's youngest children really need bold solutions right now. And I know that this committee likes to think boldly about big solutions for, for Vermont's children. Um, and so we're just encouraging you to be bold as you, as you think about this bill and the work to be done in the coming years. Um, so I wanna turn it over to the, the folks who are really um, living and breathing this on the ground every day. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, ne one never knows what, what happens with boldness, but we do our best. You do. Um, yeah. So uh, let's let's move right to Sue Minter and Sue. I understand that um, Christy Swenson is also here with you. Uh, so we'll do we. And I think we have something uh, in our documents uh, from you. So we'll we'll pick that up. And thank you for being here. We'll listen to your testimony. Thank you so much uh, for allowing us to join you in this important conversation. For the record, I am Sue Minter and I'm the Executive Director of Capstone Community Action. Uh, we are one of five community action agencies in the state of Vermont serving, uh, we Capstone serve Washington, Lamoille and uh, Orange counties. Um, and with me today is Christy Swenson, the director of our Head Start program. Um, I'm going to just start explaining a little bit about what community action is all about, and then more about Head Start, specifically Capstone's Head Start program. And we want to just say we are in 
strong support of H171 as really frontline childcare workers for the most at-risk families. But we want you to reconsider a decision the House made to put into study uh, a need that we have, that um, the child care assistance, family assistance program, financial assistance program, the CCFAP, um, be uh, based on um, enrollment rather than attendance. Um, that has now been put into a study, that recommendation that was part of the original bill. And we're going to talk about the impact that the state's decision has had on our incredible programs. But first, just to let you know, um, and I'm starting, of course, with the pictures of our beautiful children. Um, Capstone Community Action was established in 1965 uh, out of the war on poverty. And that is our mission. Uh, to help lift people out of poverty. And we have an array of programs uh, to do that. We begin really in, we see it as a two-pronged strategy. We meet people in crisis and we help them out of pro crisis and into financial and economic security. This pandemic obviously has really put on steroids our programs focused on meeting people in crisis. And by that, I mean food security. I mean um, uh, crisis fuel and heating for families. Uh, and probably most significantly, at least in our case, housing. We have been involved in multiple ways with housing our homeless families. But we also do an array of other programs. We um, create warmer and healthier and cost-effective and efficient homes through the weatherization assistance program that you are also very involved in in your work in the legislature. We support financial empowerment, helping people really become independent, starting a business, the micro business development program that you, uh, the Senate and the legislature has supported uh, through this pandemic. We do VITA, volunteer income tax preparation. Uh, we do workforce development, an array of programs. But really what I consider our flagship program is the program dedicated to breaking the generational cycle of poverty, which is absolutely essential through early education and development programs, as you see in our Head Start program. Head Start um, is a federally subsidized program uh, it doesn't cover all of the costs, the feds. We rely on the state. We raise philanthropic money to make a very holistic program. And I want you to understand it's not just childcare that this program, and it isn't for anyone. It is specifically and primarily devoted to at-risk families, which means um, families that are homeless. And by the way, 30% of the children we serve in our capstone service area are homeless, 30%. We serve generally um, in normal times, 375 families throughout our service area. So we're not one small childcare center. We actually have an array of programs. Um, stay, uh, Christy, if you can go to the next slide, it helps you um, see more carefully. Uh, by mandate, 10% of our families are children with disabilities. But we also have children in foster care. We have children whose parents um, are suffering or, or challenged by substance misuse or substance use disorder. Um, we have the children of uh, parents who are incarcerated. Uh, and we have uh, families at the federal poverty level, which you know means very low income. Um, but we aren't just uh, bringing uh, them to a childcare center. We actually have an array of programs. Um, we have um, home visitors. Those are um, families that have each week uh, a visitor, a trained home visitor coming for an hour and a half uh, to the family. Uh, we are work in partnership with uh, public pre-Ks as well as with private uh, providers. Um, but the programs that are most affected by the policy we're talking about, the CCFAP, are our center-based uh, programs. So in Capstone Service Area, we have a, a program in Lamoille County, 
as well as in Morrisville and also in uh, Barrie. Um, we uh, serve in two ways. One is called the Head Start, which is three to five year olds, and then the Early Head Start. So these are two programs, but the Early Head Start looks at pregnant mothers uh, all the way to age three. And in our Barry um, uh, Child Care Center, we actually have a program for pregnant and parenting teens where our um, young uh, pregnant moms who have dropped out of high school are enabled to get their diploma while pregnant and as their child, um, their children are born um, right there in our child care center. But what that program in, it really points out is the importance of the variety of programming. Our uh, young moms are not just uh, getting their high school diploma, they're learning how to be moms. They have access to an array of programs that all of our families do. Healthcare, oral healthcare, mental healthcare, case, uh, wraparound case management. So our families um, are, uh, you know, have a variety of needs based on trauma uh, throughout their lives, and we are there to support them. Um, and I think let's move. I think so. Here are in this, you'll see the different providing programs and the different um, who is eligible for uh, Head Start. Now I want to look at what has happened during the pandemic. Um, Obviously, the pandemic has just been an extraordinary time, and I am so in awe of our Head Start programs and staff who, you know, even we at Capstone really foresaw um, and prepared um, even before uh, the governor took action to close our schools. We made a decision, and it was a difficult one, to begin uh, to anticipate this. And actually, we uh, closed down ours, um, our care provided at our center. But what we did was we thought creatively about how to keep our programs going. So each week, we delivered to every one of our families um, packet materials, activities, and food. I hesitate, I failed to mention that food and nutrition is essential to our Head Start programs. We provide nutritious meals, a breakfast, a lunch, and a snack. And for many, perhaps most of these children, it is the only healthy meals they are able to get. So we made sure that we ensured that they continued to get them through deliveries of meals, of activity packs, and continuing to communicate with every family over the phone. We made sure they had hotspots, made sure they had phones, and we stayed in touch with them through this very stressful time. Um, we never wavered on that. And we do really appreciate that the state uh, did decide to reimburse us during the shutdown for all students enrolled in our program. But then in September, when we opened up our classrooms, we made um, very cautious and thoughtful decisions about and strategized and worked so hard about how do we open up safely? We um, did a rigorous um, following of the CDC guidelines in terms of the amount of students that could be in each space. Um, and obviously um, made the decision that we didn't open up fully because we wanted to make sure our families and our teachers were as safe as possible. We made separate entrances. Um, our classrooms never connected. Our teachers never connected and still to this day retain very safe environments for our families. And now what that required was that we did what you would call in the schools a hybrid we had two days with 50% of the classroom, one day of cleaning and, and letting the air, and then the next two days, Thursday, Friday, the other 50% of the classroom. So essentially, the number of students we were able to enroll reduced significantly, or, or the number of families that were coming. We enrolled them, but they weren't there four days a week. They were there two days a week. So what did that mean? The child care financial assistance program is based on attendance rather than enrollment. So 
for us, if you can point out here, look at the federal money that comes to just, just in capstone for our Head Start, our early Head Start program, we have $4.6 million. And then for our partnership programs, an additional $671,000, federal dollars. Normally, and how we budget every year is depending on that child care financial assistance to the tune of 847,000, as well as Act 166. So in normal times, we are seeing that if you think about this, every dollar, state dollar you are putting in, investing in this program for the most at-risk families is actually leveraging $5, five to one ratio of federal to state dollars for the incredible program that you are getting here. Now, unfortunately, because of this decision to only reimburse us based on attendance, we have lost in caps down between June of 2020 and December, $200,000 deficit. Moving forward into the year that we are now in, we are looking at an additional $237,000 deficit. So Capstone is looking at a $437,000 deficit right now that I am trying to figure out how to manage, that Christy is trying to figure out how to manage. Because of this decision, which by the way, the National Head Start Program is not reducing our their investment in us at this most critical time for our families and our communities. They are being very flexible. They are supporting us. In fact, the accolades, um, our Head Start was mentioned in a national Head Start publication because of the work we did during the pandemic. Um, other states are also paying uh, CCFAP based on enrollment. That's what we believe Vermont should do. Um, you know, what are the impacts? We have had to leave um, positions unfilled. We don't have the temporary staff, which means, you know, when a teacher is sick and can't be there, if there's no substitute, the classroom can't open. Um, so we've had a series of those. We um, can't re, re we, we gave away all of these important materials for our families to keep their children active through the pandemic, through the shutdown. We can't uh, restock. We are very much hampered and the stress on our teachers, and obviously they do their best not to make that trickle down to the families. But I just wanna uh, conclude, uh, and you can close uh, the um, presentation, Christy, by saying, you know, I really um, am amazed by our Head Start program. Uh, the results, uh, you will see incredible results in some of the materials I also presented from you from our Head Start um, uh, over a program, but what the state is getting with the federal investment in this program and the relatively minimal investment that they need to make, we really implore you to help us through these times to consider the enrollment based. Any business cannot all of a sudden not receive as when I was uh, had my children in childcare, you can be sure I had to pay my, pay my provider, whether my kids were there or not. Why would we ask something different for the lowest income students? What private business is going to ever be able to bring low income students into their pro into their childcare if they can't be paid if the student isn't there? So. I would just uh, ask your consideration um, to uh, to actually help us through this pandemic um, and really to consider reimbursement based on enrollment rather than attendance. Um, I know there are others to testify. I hope I didn't go on too long. Um, I thank you for your time and I'm here throughout this um, along with Christy to answer questions either now or at the end. Um, I will ask one question, <clears throat> actually two, I think, um, and then we'll then we'll go ahead, unless there are questions of understanding. Uh, so the amount of uh, the the dollar request that you were asking for is is that the two hundred thirty seven thousand that we see on the on the. Uh, it, it's actually 437,000 because okay. we're already 200 in our last fiscal oh. year. And now we are anticipating in this fiscal okay. year that. Okay, so for- And the that's just for Capstone. But that's right. That's not for the, all of the Head Start programs in Vermont. Okay, we'll get there. Thank you. Um, so this is just for Sue Minter at this time. Um, so uh, the, other, the other question is, are you asking for this only uh, as 
during the COVID time and recovery, or is this an ongoing request for enrollment, uh, reimbursement by enrollment? Yes, this is an ongoing request okay. for reimbursement by re enrollment as other states do. And um, I guess it's really also helping to fill our deficit during this critical time when we haven't been able to receive the reimbursement that we think is necessary. And obviously that is hampering us struggling forward. And, you know, yeah, I, I, that's okay. it, thanks. So, and with then, and then finally, um, during the pandemic, when you were receiving CRF funding, a supplemental funding, you were being paid by enrollment <clears throat> and that stopped. Christy, can you verify exactly how that happened? Yeah, June 1st, it, it okay. switched back to attendance. So you were paid from March to June. Yeah, mid, to... yeah from it was mid-March, I wanna say around the 15th through the last day of May, we were paid based on enrollment and then June 1st, it switched to attendance. Okay, and then did you get notice of that? We were notified, boy, it wasn't much notification. I don't know, Deb, if you remember, it, it feels like it was two weeks, maybe. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Senator Hardy. I, I just wanna clarify this, because this, it, it sounds like we're discussing something was specific to Capstone, and it's not. Um, no, the, we, uh, the Senator, state program. Well, let me let me explain so that people out in the the state program last year during the first um, two and a half months of the pandemic, I believe it was from like mid March through June first, paid based on um, enrollment for students in or for children in all of the programs that received CCFAP uh, payments. My, um, and then it went back to attendance base for everyone. So it wasn't specific to the programs that are here today. It was a statewide thing. And my understanding of what Sue Minter and others and, and Sarah started are asking for is not a, a change just for their programs. It's a change in the way the state does it more broadly um, and to continue what was done in the first two and a half months of the pandemic and everyone's nodding their head. So I think that's, I just wanted to make sure that was clear because that line of question made it sound like it was just Sue Minter asking for it for her program, but it's a much broader ask than that. So what we're trying to do now, thank you, Senator, that's very good clarification, but what we're trying to do now is to understand the extent to which enrollment-based reimbursement is critical for a variety of organizations across the state, so. And we do understand uh, the, what happened last year because we asked to have it happen, uh, but it was a May. So the, when you ask the administration, if you indicate to the administration that they may reimburse by enrollment, then it, it becomes a May and not a shall. So the, that's where we are with this one. Senator Cummings, and you're muted, mm -hmm. Senator. Um, this has been an issue since day one. One of my first jobs was with Head Start. Um, and the, the pay on enrollment, children get sick um, all the time, but you still have to pay the teacher. And if you don't get paid when the child isn't there, you don't have the money to pay the teacher. So this has been... I think I first ran into it in the 70s. It's been an issue forever. Completely agree. I, I ran into it in the 70s too. All right, uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you, um, Senator Lyons. Sue, maybe you could clarify for me what happens with the federal money when we're doing enrollment um, versus attendance. Well, the federal money is continues. Uh, the issue is that the you know our uh, financial our business relies on federal money. It relies on state money. It relies on uh, independent philanthropic money. And what happened is, if you take portion of the state money away, we are in this deficit. So the federal money, 
federal, the Head Start program remained very flexible and very supportive of us throughout this time. Did okay, that answer so your question? The deficit is um, the state money, the federal money isn't being affected. Not, not only getting more if we do um, if we do enrollment versus attendance, there's no more federal drawdown than there is. Or is yeah, there. I want to make sure uh, to there isn't. I, I I said it's like a match, but it isn't really a drawdown. I'm just saying that we are leveraging uh, great federal resources with a rel five to one ratio of state to federal. But it isn't a program that relies upon that state dollar to bring the federal dollar. So okay. the federals will come, will stay. Okay, thank you. All right. So I yeah. no, we're uh, thank you. No, Mr. Geller, we're going to continue on with testimony. And when we get to you, you'll be able to share with us your thoughts and perhaps answer some of these questions in your testimony. So thank you. Um, so we'll move on to Deb Gass, who is the executive director um, of early ed services in Brattleboro. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Sue, for giving a perfect uh, groundwork for um, things I don't have to say now because uh, Early Education Services is located in Wyndham County. We are a designated Vermont Parent Child Center as well as a Head Start and Early Head Start program. Uh, and we serve all of Wyndham County. We are a full day, full year operating program. Um, many of the things that Sue mentioned are also services that are provided by EES. We finance our full day model by blending Head Start, Early Head Start, and Child Development Division funds to make that full day. Head Start has never given us funding for full day operations, but they encourage us to collaborate with our partners, with our state partners to make that happen. And, and we have been doing that for many years. We serve 184 families in our Head Start and Early Head Start program, and then probably another 100 through our parent child center designation. The points uh, that I want to um, sort of endorse that Sue mentioned are first that Head Start is our, our um, funding is based on enrollment versus attendance. And so we are able to have continuity of services because we can rely on that funding model, much like businesses do. Um, and um, we, have, we have limped along through the pandemic um, with, with being able to continue to provide those full day services. We, we never, we never skipped a beat when, when the state moved into lock, lockdown or quarantine mode. EES quickly stepped up to the plate and opened essential childcare for many of our families. And we did that for about a month. We did have a COVID case we had to close for a few weeks. And then we, we booted right back up in June and opened 13 of our 15 classrooms for our families. Um, and we, we were able to use the, the, uh, the relief funds that came through the state to address the gaps, the, finance, the financial gaps that we were experiencing because we, as for all the reasons that Sue mentioned, there were days when we couldn't fully serve our families. Um, one, of the, one of the key struggles that we still are faced with is, is the daily health screens that we must conduct in response to the protocols set by the Department of Health around COVID. Um, and often some of our teachers don't pass that health screen or our subs. And so we have to close a classroom for the day, or we have to reduce the enrollment for the day and, and really try to focus just on the families who really have no other option. And so we operate with a limited staffing pattern, but those are days that we cannot bill um, the, the child development division because we are not serving particular children on that day. Our average net loss at this point is $7,000 a month. Right now we are dealing with an accumulative impact of about $35,000 in deficit that we're, we're not sure how we can address. Um, you know, we have access the funds that were, that were given to us by the state, but they have, um, you know, that's water under the bridge at this point. And 
in moving ahead, when we move, when we rise out of this pandemic, we are going to be left with the impact of the pandemic that I think still has, will have a significant tri trickle down effect. And we need to be able to stay in business to help support our families there. You know, as Sue mentioned, um, we are seeing exaggerated needs at this point and um, it will be a long recovery, I imagine. And when we don't, when we're not stable in, in our ability to rely on consistent funding, we can't keep our doors open. We can't keep staff, we can't pay staff. And, and, and you know, that leads into a, a little bit of a path that I wanted to talk about. And that is the lack of uh, early education and childcare staff that we are all struggling with that has become exacerbated by the pandemic uh, because we are, we are providing uh, care in very risky situations, or at least that's a perception. And so we're, we're having a hard time keeping our staff. EES has 15 classrooms. We have not been able to open two of our classrooms because we just can't find the staff. Um, and, and the other piece of that is that the salaries and wages for early child care, early childhood, ed, early childhood educational professionals uh, is significantly lower than what colleagues in, in, uh, in public schools are making. And, and that's general knowledge. And, and that is really steering a lot of young folks away from the field. And so again, the pandemic is only exacerbating that. And we need to be able to, to have a solid program. We need to be able to rely on solid funding I have worked in other states. Massachusetts um, is one that that bases their state <clears throat> funding on an enrollment versus, uh, I'm sorry, attendance versus enrollment model. And um, I, New Hampshire is also in the same boat. And and I think that we we need uh, the ask is that you know this is not just a snapshot situation, but a model that we are pleading with you to consider as we move forward. Um, I think uh, I think that uh, the rest of what I wanted to say really was covered in Sue's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And, it, and, and let me just say how helpful it is that that you are not we're not redundant. It's it, I think the points have been made very well, uh, and we appreciate your endorsing some of the comments that Sue Minter made as well. So thank you for that. Uh, questions of clarification committee. Okay, uh, Senator Hardy. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Deborah and Sue. I, I had a question because Sarah in her opening comments made a comment about Head Start programs being able to pay their staff more. Um, but Deb, you just made a comment about the low pay of your staff. So I'm just wondering if you, is it true that Head Start pay, uh, providers are able to pay their staff more? And if so, how much more and how, is that because of the federal money? Mm -hmm. So I would say that that is the general perception, <laughs> but it is not always true because um, Head Start does not, uh, you know, tell every every program, here's what we want you to pay your staff and here's the money to do that. Head Start gives a lump sum to each of the agencies and they say, do what you can with this, tell us how you plan to do this. And, uh, you know, Head Start is a, a locally designed model. So the amount of funds we have available to contribute towards salaries are based on our budget and what we can leverage in our community as in-kind donations. Um, I will say that in my own region, my uh, salary scale is, is comparable to that of our partners, our private partners. Uh, in, in our case, because we are also part of the Wyndham Southeast School District, we are able to tap into their benefit package. We have to pay for it, but it's more affordable because we're part of that bigger entity. So by and large, I would agree with Sarah's comment that Head Start probably has more funds to contribute toward their salaries. Nonetheless, the salaries are not commensurate with what we're asking our professionals to do and what our teachers to have in their toolbox. So the field is still in desperate need of 
more funding and financing to pay salaries commensurate with the work. And I would just add that for Capstone, <clears throat> because our Head Start is part of our community action agency, we are committed to uh, having a full benefit package. So we have health care, we have 401k, we, and that I think is not necessarily something that other healthcare providers are able to provide, but it is absolutely what uh, the bill is aspiring to. And we also, I think because of the support of Head Start, support our teachers certification. We pay for their education certification through Head Start funding. So those are two aspects that are, I think, worth mentioning relative to some of, and we, and we are a five-star high quality childcare. Um, and I would say, like Deb, what we see is we're slightly able to pay a little bit more than other uh, providers, but not as much generally as the, as the school system. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. That's good clarification. Thank you. Um, and you pay regardless of whether or not there are kids in the classroom. So, okay. Uh, so we'll move on to Steve um, Geller, who is here from... Um, the Southeastern Vermont Community Action. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, th thank you so much, Senator. Thank you all for your time and your consideration of this important issue. Um, can you hear me all right? Uh, is the volume good? I, I'm experiencing a little bit of instability. I cut out and, and got thrown off and came back at one point. So I apologize if that happens again. Um, we, as uh, Senator Lyons mentioned, we serve uh, Southeastern Vermont, Wyndham and Windsor counties. Uh, our um, Head Start Child Care and Universal Pre-K program is restricted to just Windsor County because Deb and her program are serving Wyndham County and we're doing that before we took on Head Start, you know, many years ago. Um, uh, just a quick background uh, for, of, my, of mine. Um, I am uh, the president of our state association, Vermont Community Action Partnership. I'm on the board representing New England of the National Community Action Partnership. And I've been in the community action network in four different organizations in three states for 39 years, uh, all of which uh, were in organizations that had Head Start and child care programs. So I come to this discussion to this uh, uh, you know, issue with a lot of experience. And those of you who mentioned this being an issue in the 70s, I, can, um, I wasn't in, in the system at that point, but as far back as I was in community action, starting in the early 80s, this has been a concern. Um, and ch child care in general has been looked on as, a, as an orphan child in many ways. Um, <laughs> Um, Mr. Geller, you are frozen. You're frozen. All right. Um, this is one of the beauties of having Zoom. I, <laughs> and we've all experienced it. Uh, why don't we ask uh, Elizabeth Brown uh, to go ahead. I understand that you're under some time constraints, so you're welcome. So uh, please unmute yourself and provide your testimony. That'd be very helpful. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, good morning. I am Elizabeth Brown. I am the uh, current Head Start Director for Rutland County Head Start. Um, I am new to my experience at Head Start, but absolutely love Head Start and will do anything I can to advocate for the needs of the children and families we serve. I'm here to share our experience and challenges with the current model of reimbursement that is based on attendance versus enrollment and to express my support for the passing of the child care bill H-171 with the added piece of shifting in, uh, reimbursement to enrollment versus attendance. In order to really understand and gain insight into the importance of enrollment versus attendance, it'll be important to go back to 2010. In 2010, the state ended contracted slots. These contracted slots meant predictable income and in turn, a clearer way to intentionally plan for the fiscal year ahead. When the contracted slots ended and we moved to an attendance-based model, Rutland County Head Start had to terminate five full-time employees due to the significant loss of revenue and the unpredictable income we received. 
The shift in the current model makes stabilizing our budget and even staffing very difficult. As you all have noted, the overhead costs of staffing, facilities, program supplies, and administrative costs do not shift or change based on a child's attendance. The costs are consistent. While much of our funding comes from the federal government, we do rely on CCFAP to round out our budget and to support our ability to provide our children with full-time early care and education programming that many of our full-time working families need desperately. Without a consistent income, organizations like Head Start will feel at the mercy of the attendance records of our children. Rutland County Head Start, like many of the programs you've heard from, serve the most vulnerable children in our community. We serve 117 children and families with multiple risk factors that make them some of the most vulnerable individuals we serve. In some cases, we are at a family's last resort for care because of the high quality staff we hire, the comprehensive services we provide, and the mental health services that we have integrated into our program. Like our children, the, like, our, like the children and families we walk alongside, we too need stability and consistency to ensure our programming can continue and can maintain the highest quality of care and education that we are passionate about delivering. This last fiscal year, like many of the other programs, Rutland County Head Start suffered a loss of over $200,000. We anticipate that loss to be even greater as we look towards our current fiscal year. This loss has created a significant reduction in any emergency reserves we may have and will be felt for many years to come. It is hard for me to understand why when a child is out due to a multitude of reasons that are beyond our control, we as an organization must struggle to front the bill. It is my hope that the committee will demonstrate its dedication and investment into the lives of our youngest and most vulnerable residents by passing the child care bill H-171 and by allowing us to not only survive but to thrive regardless of the adversities we may face as we work hard to provide the highest level of care and education to the children and families in Vermont. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Elizabeth, that was very clear. Um, questions of clarification. All right, uh, I think that we're really getting, beginning to get a picture and we appreciate the the clarity that you bring to the to the issue. Um, Steve Geller, are you there? I am here. Can you All hear right. me? M maybe by leaving your video off, um, you you won't freeze. Thank you, Elizabeth. Take care. Uh, yes, I, I thought that was a good, a good idea. I'll try that. All um, right. but just uh, I think begin where you. Uh, were. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure where I was. I'm sorry. I, I think I'm not sure where I was. It, you had made an introduction to yourself and your organization. And I think stating the, the problem that's facing you is probably a, a good place to start. Okay, uh, sure. Um, I, I think uh, I, I was starting to say that um, childcare has for many, many years, as people have pointed out, uh, been uh, looked on as sort of an orphan child in, in um, you know, in term, in professional terms, um, like babysitters instead of the child development program that it really is. And Head Start, it really um, ups that game to a tremendous degree because of the standards that we have to follow uh, when we provide any kind of care or development, uh, developmental support within Head Start. Um, and, and I'm not gonna repeat what, what uh, folks have already said very articulately. I'll just try to you know, add to compliment what they said by providing a, a perspective that might be helpful for you to think about. Um, the, the way childcare is often dealt with, and I think the, the, the question of this attendance versus enrollment reimbursement issue is an example of that, is, is that it's almost like uh, it's perceived as an impulse buy. Like, like when you uh, want to go to a movies at night and you call the babysitter and say, are you available? They come down, you pay them that night and, and, you know, and that transaction is, is complete. That's not the way childcare typically works in the real world and especially not on a, on a long-term basis. Um, it's not, if you think about what impulse buys are that, that are additional income for, um, 
for businesses that they don't depend on for their survival, for their livelihood, like chewing gum and five hour energy drinks, beef jerky or fidget spinners. That's not what childcare is. We all agree uh, that it's, it's a vital service that people have to plan for, scheme, cajole, and sometimes bribe their way for years to obtain the best option for their kids. Uh, and it's critical in so many ways to help families build better futures for their children. It enables healthy child development. It prepares kids for transition to succeed in school and in later life. And uh, it's an invaluable support for workforce development uh, it, that allows motivated workers to enter and stay in the workforce uh, and for employees to obtain qualified work, the, the qualified workforce they need. Uh, it's a mission-driven enterprise that depends on reliably consistent compensation for sustainability. It can't survive on walk-in impulse buying, attendance-based payment only when kids show up. Empty slots must be committed to and paid for to support qualified work the facilities they work in, the equipment they need, and the materials, license requirements, and everything else that comes with uh, a professional quality childcare um, business uh, and, and uh, operation. Uh, and if we're serious about enabling equitable access to opportunity and healthy child development, and to eliminate the chronic intergenerational uh, poverty that we see all over our state, then the state must commit to be the reliably consistent payer for those services, since their cost is beyond the reach of the families that we know need this service with low and often even moderate incomes. Uh, and without them, they're stuck on the treadmill that goes nowhere. Um, qual uh, quality affordable childcare is inherently beneficial, as many have pointed out, but Head Start's value added benefits uh, add even more to it. Uh, such as full-featured proven child development outcomes, overcoming the disadvantages of poverty, comprehensive family support services, full-day wraparound care and flexibility to support working parents, progressive career path and dependable jobs with livable wages and excellent benefits. And uh, I want to also just clarify something that, that Sumitra had said about the leveraging of the federal dollars. Uh, while there's no, um, you know, strict one-to-one -one, uh, match that says if you, uh, for every dollar you don't bring in, you're not going to be able to get your federal funding. There is, however, a requirement that at least 25% of the total funding for our programs for which we get Head Start grants be funded by other than the federal grant that we get. So one quarter of the funding is really, is a required, a mandated match uh, that we have to come up with uh, either through, uh, through a combination of uh, cash from other sources that are not federal and, uh, and or in-kind contributions. And th the truth is that for the most part, we need that additional uh, dollar, those additional dollars in, uh, in cash because the federal grant is only really giving us 75% of what we need to operate a full featured quality comprehensive program as we do. So think of it this way, that there's a three to one return on investment at a minimum. And as Sue pointed out for her program, it's more, it is for mine as well, but it's, it has to be at least a three, three to one ROI on every state dollar provided for sustainable child care uh, due to the Head Start grant requirement. And, um, and that leverage funding is something that benefits all the children in the program in the state because of the, uh, you know, the way that operates and, and, and enables us in most cases to leverage even more than that minimum. Uh, so th there's, been a, there's been a misconception that, that has occurred in the debate about whether Head Start programs should be eligible for uh, Act 166 funding for participation in the universal pre-K program in Vermont. That was settled, a settled precedent that it is, some people said that, well, we already run these programs, so you're double dipping. But it was based on a mis this misconception that we didn't have to get additional funding to operate the programs. The fact is that we do, and, and that money that comes in that the federal dollars require our leveraging 
bring, helps to keep those federal dollars in the state. So all for all those reasons, it's critical that there be this reliable and consistent uh, method, the, the enrollment based method, not the attendance only when kids are in the seats uh, uh, method uh, to, to fund the pro program so that the low income people, low income families that need this program, need the childcare most desperately are able to get it in order for them to work, in order for them to get trained uh, for all the things that are necessary and our benefits from them having the childcare they need for their children. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Have an yeah, answer. Steve, that was that was very, very helpful. And we don't have your testimony on our web page, but if you can get us something in writing, we would appreciate that. Sure. Perfect. Questions of clarification. All right, we're good. I've, we, we're, we're beginning to get the full picture. So this is extremely helpful. Um, and we will turn to Linda January from Otter Creek uh, Child Care Center. Is she, where is she? There, are, there you are. I think you you kept moving around on my screen. Uh, welcome. <laughs> the Linda. joys of Zoom. Yeah. Um, Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, for the record, my name is Linda January. I'm the executive director of Otter Creek Child Center in Middlebury, Vermont. Um, and I run a very different program <laughs> um, from Head Start, although we are an early Head Start partner with um, Champlain Valley Head Start, um, our day to day operations look a little bit different. Um, I sat down to write this and um, had a little bit of a deja vu moment. <laughs> it was almost two years ago to the date that I testified. Um, in the House on a very similar bill um, that H-171 is still um, issues that it's still pushing forward. And I hope to just give you a little bit of a highlight into um, the impacts it will have on programs as well as families. Um, Otter Creek is a, a nonprofit organization. We were founded in 1984 as an infant and toddler center, and uh, we now serve up to preschoolers. We currently have 45 children. We have 13 full-time teachers, three part-time teachers, two full-time administrators, a part-time administrative assistant, a part-time bookkeeper, um, and a handful of regular substitute teachers who are in and out of the building. Um, we have an average cost per child for this current school year of just over $14,000, uh, sorry, just over $21,000. Um, the average amount of tuition dollars coming in per child is only um, $14,000. So there's a, a funding gap of just over $7,000 per child when it comes to tuition funding. And tuition funding comes from um, CFAP dollars, from uh, co-pays, family co-pays. We do have a lot of families who are at 100 or who pay 100% out of pocket. Um, you yeah, and Act 166 dollars. Um, but because of this funding gap, we 28% of our budget comes from other revenue sources outside of tuition. And of that 28%, over 71,000 of it is grant funds. Um, we budget about 11,000 for fundraising, and that's on a good year. Um, last year and this year were not good fundraising years. Um, if we were to lose our biggest grant of $40,000, we would have to reduce three of our teachers from 40 hours a week to 30 hours a week, which would impact our programming. Um, and we currently fund around $14,000 in scholarships to families. So that that's funds that we raise um, through grants, through um, town support, and that we um, bring back into our budget as scholarship support for families. And most of those families are receiving a CFAP dollars. Some are receiving 100%. Um, and because of 
where our rates at and where subsidy rates currently are, there's a gap. And so we um, fill that gap with uh, scholarship dollars. And families who fall below 100%, we automatically give them a scholarship and they pay. Um, so if a family comes in at 25%, their copay is up to 80% of the subsidy rate, and then we cover um, the remaining of the tuition dollars. <laughs> um, if the changes in H-171 come to full for tuition and my board um, makes this decision to go full throttle and just ride the, this, <laughs> this way with the state then it could increase our it could inc we would see an increase of ninety seven thousand dollars to our budget through tuition payments um we would become less reliant on grant funds to balance the budget um, instead grants would be able to enhance the program instead of balancing the budget um, Sixteen percent of our revenue would come from other revenue sources, and this is all. These are already revenue sources that are built into our budget. Um, the need for in-house scholarship would um, lessen, reducing our expenses. And my position, I would be able to shift my time from fiscal oversight to program support. Um, these are all huge things. Um, time is. <laughs> is so precious and my time in classrooms supporting teachers, um, I think that for me would be more um, than anything, would benefit our program more than anything. Um, and then the changes for families. So we currently have a family, uh, it's a two um, parent home, both, family, both parents are working full time they have a toddler and an infant that are enrolled full-time um, five days a week. Um, they make approximately $68,772 a year. This brings them in um, to receive subsidy at 25% of the full-time rate. So on the chart, <laughs> their copay, their monthly copay for two children under the age of two is over $2,400 a month. Um, they bring in the subsidy pays about $606 a month of that tuition, and we provide a scholarship of $609. So their monthly copay is $1,260 a month. That's 22% of their income. Um, with the changes that are proposed in H-171, that family would come in at 275% of the federal poverty level, making their maximum copay um, for the month around $541.25. That's 9% of their um, income. So it reduces their copay by 43%. Um, they would no longer would need scholarship funds, and we would receive the full tuition, um, full tuition would be collected. Um, this is huge for families. Like I could, I could probably give you 10 other examples. Um, we not only, you know, we have families who are receiving subsidy now who will, re who will move up um, and will receive more support. And then we have, um, this group of families that we're cradling with our in-house scholarship funds that right now aren't eligible for um, CFAP dollars, but they will become eligible. Um, and it will just, it will be a game changer for them. Um, the other pieces around H-171 that are huge for Otter Creek are the scholarship and loan repayments, or um, not, yeah, <laughs> um, repayments. So we currently have three teachers who are, who are receiving TEACH scholarships through um, the Vermont Association of Education for Young Children. And one of those teachers are currently, she's graduating this May, which is super exciting. She's been um, attending CCD part-time, um, working full-time for the past four years. Um, and 
we are all so excited that she um, has made this achievement. And along the way, she has moved up the career ladder. She has gotten bonuses. She has gotten raises. Um, and yet it's not enough. Um, she will be graduating and it, without being able to um, continue on with a B um, in a bachelor's because there's no scholarship support or significant scholarship support for her to do so. Um, and even though she will be getting a raise, it's not enough to continue to support um, higher education as she's struggling to pay rent and um, health care. We don't offer health care, so she um, goes through the exchange and it's not really affordable. Um, and it sometimes doesn't feel like real insurance. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we have a goal that if a teacher comes to us who just graduated and has a teaching license in early childhood education, that we're able to pay them $40,000 a year. Um, currently, if that person came to us, it would take them 13 years of working with us before they reach 40,000 on our current salary scale. We also have a goal um, to pay entry level teachers $15 an hour, and we're currently at $13.50 an hour. Um, we also wanna be able to offer a comprehensive benefit package, and we can't do that. We do have some, you know, the benefits we do have, they're good benefits. Um, we have wonderful paid time off, um, paid holidays, um, short-term and long-term disability, but it's nowhere near enough to um, make this field sustainable for teachers. Um, when I talk to Kelsey about her future, and it's heartbreaking to me to hear this young teacher who is graduating with her associate's degree feel really defeated about this field and, and thinking that long-term this isn't gonna be an option. And these bridge supports would really help teachers um, as the state and administration continue to build out on what's outlined in H-171, um, you know, to get us to a place where um, we're able to offer a comparable wage to public schools with an affordable um, benefit package. Um, and then just the last piece is the, the studies that are in H-171. I strongly recommend them and feel that they're um, really necessary to see this full vision out. Um, the, the analysis study, you know, before any big changes happen to our system, um, it's really important to know what's working, what's not working. Um, you know, what is the field thinking about it? How, how does the field perceive this system that we live and breathe, breathe every day? Um, and the financial study, you know, the field is excited. We are so excited. We feel like for the first time, like it's gonna happen. <laughs> like we've been working so hard. Um, to feel like we've been heard, to feel like we're gonna be at a place where we can um, pay our teachers and afford to keep our teachers and to make it affordable for families. Um, and yet with that excitement comes some skeptic, right? How, how is this going to happen? And the financial study will really answer those questions of how will it be sustainable? The field needs to know that this is really that this investment and that this plan um, is not just a short term, that this is the long haul. Um, and this financial study will answer those questions and show um, the field that the, the state and the administrator, administration is serious about 
um, supporting early childhood education at a level that it should be. Thank you very much. Um, that you, you have each, uh, and, and you, Linda, inclu including you in this, you've provided um, a, a really nice set of uh, information that's going to help us as we go through H-171. Um, it's not that we are unaware of the issues, but it is just critically important that we understand what's happening on the ground, and you have provided that for us. We're acutely aware of the high rate of turnover and the, the inability of folks to continue where they love to work the most with kids. And so we're, we're very appreciative of the time that you've taken to bring us your testimony. Um, committee, any uh, final questions of clarification? Okay, um, thank you all. And we'll give you a minute to, to scoot off because we're moving on to the, the next topic of the day, but this topic is really important to us. And, and by the way, we are returning to H171 next week. So we'll, we'll spend, I forget which day it is, it's Wednesday or Thursday, we'll spend a significant amount of time talking about the bill and um, we'll keep all of your testimony in mind as we go forward, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Senators. We Thank appreciate you. Take it. Take care. Right. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Bye. Take care. Wow. Feels like a small committee. <laughs> Where'd everyone go? Well, Cheryl went for some reason. <laughs> Maybe she'll be back. <laughs> Uh-oh. I don't know where she went. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, um, we have, uh, that was terrific, I think. Um, and we'll, we'll have to spend some time understanding the, I, I don't know whether, um, here she comes back in. I don't know whether uh, Nolan did a, a fiscal note on the cost, the total cost for enrollment-based um, reimbursement for this, I do know that there's some there's CCFAP increase in the bill, and we also know that there's a cap on uh, family expenditures uh, of 10% of one's salary. And I think we just got a picture of how much it is when it's not 10%. Uh, that's pretty astounding. Um, you know, just trying to think about if if someone has three or four kids in childcare, that's a, that might end up being a bit costly. So, um, so keep, keep your thoughts about that and we'll, we'll have to have a broad discussion about that next week when we come back to the bill. Um, so I think what we should do now, I, I do have a couple comments that we'll save for the end of the, of the day, but I think we should move on our continuing interest in looking at um, the, uh, all payer model and the healthcare implementation plan that we have in front of us. And I've invited Ina back as director of healthcare reform from the Agency of Human Services to give us some information. Ina, you are here. Thank you for being back. Uh, appreciate it greatly. Um, my question for you is would you allow for my committee a, a, a two minute stretch? All right. So, and we're going to, we'll stretch that out. Take three minutes.